Lisa and Andy, hello. Hello, How's what have I let myself in for? Well, let's find out, shall we? Yeah, go on then. Um, let's talk about winning. Okay. Tell me about something you've won outside of politics. Tell me about something that you've won. Like a sort of raffle prize. Could be a raffle prize, <laughs> but I would say that's probably not the best qualification for being leader of the Labour Party. Yeah, I don't tend to win the raffle, actually. And the, the worst thing about being an MP is that when you do, you have to put it back in. There's an example that, that springs to mind of something that we sort of won. Um, but it really, the way we won it really ma mattered to me. So a few years ago, a group of young people from my constituency came to see me about um, the education maintenance allowance. And the coalition government had decided to just scrap it. Now this was a real game changer for young people in towns like Wigan, because although we argued a lot about tuition fees, which I was opposed to, actually getting through college was the biggest issue for a lot of young people across this country and especially if you come from a big family with a fairly low income base it really really mattered and so we they came to see me and said look it's going what are we going to do for a lot of them it was the difference between being able to carry on at college or not so we got a petition together got thousands of kids from across Wigan to sign it there was a really cool thing that we did with a bunch of other MPs where they got their young people to do the same and they went off and drove that petition and then came down to London and they marched and there was a, a really lovely moment where we were in central lobby and they were chasing Lib Dem ministers into cupboards and things who just did not want to account for the consequences of their actions. Anyway the upshot of all of this was that we didn't win the whole thing they still scrapped the EMA but they said that any young person who'd started could carry on getting it until they finished college. And that made a difference for tens of thousands of young people across the country who then finished their courses and went on to university. The Lib Dems, during their time in coalition, alienated a lot of young voters. And if the Lib Dems have lost that support, that would perhaps incline me to say that initially the Labour Party could pick up those votes. But it hasn't. The last general election, terrible show, worse since 1935. What do you think went wrong? Well, I think that we did particularly badly with older voters. Um, so actually amongst people, particularly young professionals, young graduates, I think we did a bit better than that. And there were a lot of young people who were very inspired to join the Labour Party in the last few years. I think that's a consequence not of the sort of cool campaigning techniques that we like talking about. And some of them are pretty cool and they're, they're really useful. Um, but it People don't join the Labour Party or join political parties because they like campaigning techniques. They join because they believe in what you stand for. And there was an important moment in 2015 that we shouldn't lose sight of, which was the moment when Jeremy won and said, like, this country can and will be better, and talked about a fairer society and talked about standing up with compassion for people who don't have a lot, who are having a hard time, whether it's refugees and asylum seekers or people in the benefits system, people with disabilities who've had a really, really tough time under this government. And for me, that was a really important moment because that is what I think really attracted a lot of young people to us. But at the same time, we continued on a path that we've been on for a really, really long time in this party, where people in coalfield constituencies like mine have felt that we've become very, very disconnected um, from their lives, from an understanding of what's happening in their lives. It used to be that Labour was rooted in those communities and that we were speaking the same language. And over the last few decades, what we've seen is a process happen where lots of jobs have been lost in those areas. And the investment has gone into the cities in the hope that the benefits will trickle out. Well, that's meant that young people have to choose. They have to choose between home and family and the future and opportunity. And for some young people like me, that is the choice that I wanted to make. I wanted to move away. I wanted to see the world. I wanted to move to London and you know, work with homeless teenagers and do look do get lots of opportunities I wouldn't have had at home. But for other young people, that's quite desperate. And so you've got this settlement now where in some parts of the country, where Labour's doing well, you've got lots of young graduates in the cities. But in other parts of the country, you've got lots of older people watching the young people leave, the spending power leave their communities, the scars are visible on the high streets and the boarded up pubs and the cancelled bus networks. And they're growing old hundreds of miles away from children and grandchildren. Now, we haven't had anything to say to those people for a very long time. And at, at best, we've been disinterested. At worst, we've just shrugged our shoulders and said the world has moved on you just get on board or get out of the way what's the point of politics if it can't actually address the very emotional important things in people's lives admittedly Jeremy Corbyn is obviously a, an Islington MP he's part of that sort of the London set if you like they're set down here but I would also 
sort of ascribe him to the same school as sort of your Dennis Skinner's in Bolsover mm -hmm. and um, Blythe Valley, Bassett Law. Like, I wouldn't necessarily say that he's out of touch with those places. So I'm wondering why he perhaps, what did he miss that you've, that you've just identified there? Why, why wasn't he able to recognise that and do something about it? I think he did recognise it to an extent. Certainly in the last few years, I had a lot of conversations with him about Brexit and he got a lot of stick for holding the line on Brexit and trying to, to speak for both parts of the country and for Leave and Remain voters alike. Now, we didn't succeed in that at all. And in my view, that was largely because we had one group of people in the Shadow Cabinet out arguing for Remain and another group out arguing for Leave. And actually, we should have been doing the much harder thing, which was about how you speak for both. You know, I was trying to do that back home in Wigan. Two thirds of my constituents voted to leave, but a third voted to remain and they matter to me. And they have as much right to a stake in the future of this country as anybody else. And we should have been trying to bring the country back together. But I think he did recognise actually that that was important. I think he was one of the only reasons why actually we, things weren't slightly worse for us um, because there were, you know, because people could see that there was at least a few people in the Labour Party who were busy sort of standing up for compromise and for conciliation and for bringing people together and for speaking for both halves. But actually, this is a really long-term trend in the Labour Party. We've become very, very centralised in central London. It's why one of the first things I said was that we would move headquarters out of London if I became leader of the Labour Party. There's no reason why we're writing policies and deciding where we spend resources and who our candidates are from behind a desk in Southside. It's part of the problem that we've become completely disconnected from those communities. And you know, Nye Bevan didn't need a focus group or a think tank report to tell him to set up the National Health Service. This comes from being rooted out in the country. And if we're gonna win back trust, that is the only way that we're gonna do it. During the Channel 4 leadership hustings, Krishnan asked, it was during that quick fire segment, which I think, um, I don't think you were too keen on, but... We threatened to go on strike at one point. Yeah, yeah very, very Labour of you. Um, the, but the question about the best, the best leader of the Labour Party, and wh whilst we're on this subject of winning, Tony Blair is the last winning leader of the Labour Party, right? He wasn't even mentioned. Not, not a hint at it not a suggestion that he might be the best leader of the Labour Party when he is, in modern history, probably one of, its most, one of the most successful leaders of the party. Why do you think that is? I think that the debate in Labour has become very reductionist and binary in recent years. And we've gone straight, for, on almost every issue, we've gone straight from um, the starting point of a debate to pick a side and fight it out. And you've seen it a lot over Brexit, but we also, we've seen it in this contest over the, the attempt to pit um, trans people's rights against the right of women to access safe spaces. We've seen it with um, the debate around Israel and Palestine as if it's a zero sum game that you either believe in the right of Israel to exist or you believe in the rights of the Palestinian people. And I think that the debate around leadership has become very like that as well. You can be a Blairite or you can be a Corbynista and there's absolutely nothing in the middle. But what if you could believe, for example, that Tony Blair built a strong, broad, successful team that took us into government and implemented game changing things like the minimum wage, which at the time people said was n not possible, that the sky would fall in if you did it and that were completely revolutionary but also had a massive lasting impact that you know the civil partnerships work that they did and championing LGBT rights these are things that really really mattered what if you could believe all of that to be true and also believe that the last Labour government wasn't radical enough particularly in terms of the economy where we thought you could just take a bit from people at the top and hand it with conditions to people at the bottom not smash up that power settlement that has existed in this country and held people back for generations. What if you think that we did lots of really good work, for example, on supporting child refugees in the latter years of the last Labour government? Gordon Brown brought them within the the spectrum of the Children Act um, and brought them within a department for children, schools and families, was quite receptive to the arguments that I and other people were making about closing down Yarlswood um, and providing much more support early on for families. What if you could believe that and also think that we got it horribly wrong in the early days when we were bringing in destitution laws that I was taking the last Labour government to court over to starve children out of the country? What if you could actually have a sort of 
proper, honest reckoning with what we did in government, with what we've done in the last five years, without reducing it to a Jeremy Corbyn, Tony Blair, 10 out of 10. And part of the reason I'm standing, I'm standing because I want to win and because I believe this country can be better. But part of the way I believe this country can be better is to raise the bar on the level of debate. This is not the debate that we deserve. We can do better. Imagine. Um, <laughs> on the concept of, uh, on the subject, sorry, of Tony Blair, are you prepared to compromise your principles in order to win? I'm prepared to listen and have a dialogue with the public. And that is really, really important because in the last few years, I think we've fallen into the trap of doing what people... I got elected in 2010, right? And we were doing this in 2010 and we're still doing it now, is that we broadcast to the nation. So we announce our manifesto, we announce our policies, we announce to people that we know what the problem is, we know how to fix it and we're the right people to do it. And that is what I think accounts for the notion that we're all the same. I remember knocking on doors a few years ago and somebody said to me, no, 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 love, you're all the same. I think he said to me, as far as I'm concerned, you're all paddling in the same canoe, which is a phrase I've never heard before or since. But, I like it. But it was quite extraordinary because you had Jeremy Corbyn as the leader of the Labour Party and Theresa May at the time as leader of the Tories. And I'm thinking, these are not the same. I mean, this was the most after Theresa May had decided that she was going to out UKIP, UKIP. And I was looking at the guy going, no, actually, we're not all the same. You must have missed something. But it was that sense that he was talking about, that we come into areas and we say, we know the problem, we know how to fix it, we're the people to do it. There's no real dialogue about what the problem is. So we were knocking on doors in Lee during the general election and we had some really good stuff on nationalising the railways, taking them back into public hands, sorting out the problems on Northern Rail, which is a huge issue around our way. But there's no train station in Lee. So, you know, I know that I keep going on about it and I've gone on about it so much that I've become a meme. But people just want a functioning bus network. And although we had a good policy about it, we had two paragraphs in our manifesto about it. and We had pages on rail. And actually, you know, broadband, it's not a bad policy when you think that Digital infrastructure in this country is a disaster outside of central London, mm -hmm. but it's, you know, that wasn't the priority for people. And if we'd been having a dialogue, we would have heard and understood that. I think the best example of this actually is free movement. So when, you know, I was the first Labour MP to come out and say we should defend the principle of free movement. And a year ago, I was saying to our front bench, you have got to drop this commitment to end free movement. Not only is it inconsistent with a good deal that protects jobs and keeps us in the customs union and access to the single market, but it's also you've taken the wrong cues from what's just happened out in the country. And people couldn't quite believe that I was saying that you know we can make a moral case for free movement it's a good thing because I represent a town that voted so heavily to leave but actually having had that conversation with my constituents for a decade what I'd come to understand is that it wasn't an issue for them that people were coming and working in our hospital they were pleased about that and they were grateful to the people who were doing it but when you've abolished the nursing bursary and you've got rid of the EMA and their children don't have a hope of getting a job in the hospital that they can see just a few miles down the road, that becomes completely unsustainable. So it's skills, 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 or as someone once put it, education, education, education. So Blair Lovin. <laughs> um. I don't know how he'd feel about that, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> He'll probably come out and condemn me after this interview yeah. goes out. Yeah. Well, actually, no, let's talk about immigration then. So this week points-based system, which for all the rhetoric and all the talk about how this is going to reduce immigration, it's actually quite a liberal model. Um, the use of it in Australia, by all accounts, has actually increased the amount of people coming into their country. What do you think of that, first of all, um, as our approach to yeah, dealing with immigration in this country? Do you think a points-based system is the right way to go? I mean, I think the benefit of a points-based system is that um, it's easily explainable and understandable to the public. So the last Labour government brought in a points-based system. I was working with immigrants at the time at the Children's Society with them. Um, unaccompanied minors and refugee families and um, so a lot of people particularly trafficking victims weren't recognized as asylum cases they were going through the immigration system instead and the points based model at least people could get hold of it and they could understand it and it appeared on the surface that there was an element of fairness of it but it depends a lot on what the rules are and how those rules are implemented and if you get the rules wrong they can be very very discriminatory against certain people from certain countries people from certain backgrounds 
backgrounds. Uh, my worry about what the Tories are doing, though, is twofold, right? One is that I'm not sure that they've really thought any of this through. It looks like a back of a fag packet sort of plan, to be honest, that they've come up with because they want to show that they're being tough on immigration, but they haven't thought about the needs of the country. I represent an area where you've got a very ageing population, where we desperately need people working in our social care sector. The idea that we would stop people from coming into work in our social care sector and at the same time do nothing to put investment into people here who were already work in the social care sector and we would describe social carers as low skilled just seems to me a way of taking a really big challenge from the country and making it a hell of a lot worse. But the second problem with it is that it seems to me that this is part of the same dog whistle immigration politics that we've seen a lot of from the Tories in recent years. And at my mo the, when I was most critical of the last Labour government, it was when we became a voice for that shrill, sour, hopeless politics. There is no future in that. And that's the Labour Party that I want to lead and the Labour Party that I want to see is a Labour Party that will stand up to that loud and clear. You know, as I say to my constituents all the time, like immigration is not the reason that we've got ambulances backed up outside the hospital and people sleeping rough outside the train station. It's not the reason that the trains have been in chaos for two years and that bus routes have been cut by 10% over the last 10 years. The, these problems are problems that have been caused by the Tory government, not by immigrants. And we've got to stand up and win that argument out in the country. So if you're the Labour leader, what's your policy on immigration? Are you going to stick with points? How are you going to award them? Is it open borders? What's your approach? Well, it depends when you become Labour leader because, you know, the problem for, the, for us is that we've lost an election. I mean, really lost an election in every nation and region of the UK. We've seen our Labour base collapse. And so for the next four years, we've got to think seriously about what we're going to do so that we're not just on the back foot trying to defend some of the things that have been lost, but we're actually out in the country building the case. So the first thing that I would do is to go out and try and win the argument. You know, I believe that free movement is a good thing. I believe that immigration is a good thing, but it has to be fair. And so it has to be coupled with investment in people. When I went to Germany just after the referendum result here, the, I went to Berlin to meet some of the progressive politicians over there and they said, look, Britain is just a basket case. You know, you're very different from us. You've never got Europe and you probably never will. And then I went over to Cottbus, which is a town about an hour outside of Berlin. It's very similar to Wigan. It used to have a lot of industry. Industries disappeared. The government's tried to give tax incentives for companies to come and base themselves there. But once the tax incentives dried up, they all left again. And um, exactly the same sentiment there, with support for free movement very, very weak, because people saw it as something that benefited other people, but not themselves, because the investment hasn't gone into skills there. There's a basic question of fairness about how we make sure that when we build an immigration system that enables people to travel, study, you know, advance science and arts and culture and music, when we build an immigration system that is open and enables the world to rise up together, that we are helping people to rise up together and that we're reaching people, not just people who already had those opportunities, but people who don't. I can't even remember what your question was. I'm really sorry. <laughs> uh, it's what your immigration policy would be. Waxing lyrical about immigration. But it's, you know, actually, so, so I think the, the basic sentiment behind it has got to be there is no substitute for going out and winning that argument in the country. Mm. And that means that you have to listen because you have to understand why it is that people in towns like mine, where they're very welcoming, where they're very supportive of people from different backgrounds, where they fight off the far right over and over again and where they set up support projects for asylum seekers in a town like that why support for free movement was very very low and you've got to hear what people are saying otherwise you take all the wrong cues from what's going on in the country and that's how you end up compromising on your principles in order to win power so that sort of follows on to my next question which is do you think you're nasty enough to take on boris johnson <laughs> um the reason i say that it's a nasty piece of work. Yeah. Well, because the sort of the most effective political operator in this country over the last few years, decades, Dominic Cummings, Alistair Campbell, no disrespect to the two of them, but they're pretty ru they're ruthless in the way they conduct themselves. When the sort of the leading voice of criticism in this country about the government's approach to Grenfell, Windrush, um, immigration more, more broadly, is Dave performing at the Brits. Jeremy Corbyn's strategy of going high when they go low clearly hasn't worked. So do you think you're gritty enough 
to be that person so that it's actually the leader of the Labour Party that's making those criticisms rather than admitting an incredibly talented and a, 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 a voice for a lot of people in this country. But perhaps our political leaders should also be making those points. So I think there's something really fundamental about the leadership that the country wants right now in this question, which is that in the past in the Labour Party, we've sort of had a debate about whether you choose a leader who... Um, you know, rep represent someone who can win elections, so you go with your head, or somebody who can stand up for our values, so you go with your heart. And the choice between sort of power and principle has run right through that like a thread. I don't think the public is willing to allow that choice anymore. I think if you look at who is actually making waves and connecting with people, not just in this country, but around the world, whether it's Finland or New Zealand, it's much more a leader and lead a model of leadership that is about protecting your integrity, protecting your principles, being honest and authentic with people. They can smell it when you're not. And so when we say we're a compassionate party, that really matters. When we say we don't want to be horrible to asylum seekers, we're not going to put immigration slogans on mugs, we're not going to turn up at Labour Party conference and announce the first thing we would do would be to cut child benefit because that is fundamentally not who we are and not what we believe in. I think the public is quite desperate for that, actually. Even if they don't agree with you, they respect the fact that you're honest and you're principled and you're authentic. And so this is a leadership election in which I don't think people have to choose between head and heart. Not only can you have both, you must have both, otherwise you're not going to win. And Dave is a really good example of this because that was the best political speech I've seen in a decade. And it was the best political speech because it was completely and utterly authentic. It was honest, it was real, it was rooted in, you could feel a lifetime of experience about what it feels like to be on the receiving end of racism and to witness the way in which the debate about racism has developed in this country. The writer Afua Hirsch wrote a really good piece a few years ago where she talked about Donald Trump and how he says he's not a racist. And she said, not being a racist is not good enough. You're either a racist or you're an anti-racist. And being an anti-racist means taking an active stance against racism for the sort of country that you believe in. And that's one of the reasons why I stood up about anti-Semitism in the Labour Party, because I know that, because I'm half Indian, because I've seen it and heard it all my life. Not necessarily directed towards me, but towards friends, towards family. And, you know, I speak as someone whose dad came to this country in the 50s, in a time of no blacks, no Irish, no dogs. He, he ended up getting involved in the race relations struggle because he had no choice. And that led him to go and help with the writing of the Race Relations Act, one of the greatest gifts that Labour's ever given to this country. But when he and his generation reflect on what's happened since, they feel that most of the progress that was made in that era has unravelled in recent decades. And that, for me, is one of the things that drives me the most because we will not allow that to happen. We will not be the generation that dropped the ball, that allowed all of that progress to unravel. Every generation has to seek to advance. And that, for the Labour Party, that has never been the party of the status quo, that has always gone out and fought for a better world, this is one of those moments when we've got to stand up. What are you least looking forward to about being Labour leader? Oh, well, there's going to be one hell of a battle in the first few weeks because I have refused to move to London. Um, so I've been having a bit of a running battle with Andrew Marr over the last few years because um, I don't go on his show because I will not go down to London on a sun Saturday night in order to spend time in a TV studio in central London on a Sunday talking about how you rebuild support in the north of England. Just strikes me that this is the problem in a nutshell. And so um, when I move Labour HQ to Warrington, which <laughs> I've, been, I've been looking at the Labour leadership contend deputy leadership contenders and trying to work it out. Mm. Um, the one that I know best in the Labour deputy leadership contest is Angela Rayner because she's from our neck of the woods. So I figured if she wins, there's quite a nice little commute for the pair of us. Lovely. Um, but if, um, that is going to be one hell of a battle. I didn't realise until I said that how angry that makes a lot of people. But that is the lesson about power, is that if you want to disperse power more widely, then a small group of people who've held on to it for a long time are going to lose. And that is a, that is a, that is a tough battle, but it's a battle that I am more than ready to have. You, um, you touched on the media there, and I wonder if you subscribe to the notion 
um, that there's been a sort of smear campaign against broadly the Labour Party, but also Jeremy in the media. Would you agree with that sentiment? So there's been a very, very personal campaign about him. There's, I, I mean, I think this happens to every Labour leader, but this, I think particularly because of social media, it stepped up at this election. So in 2017, we were hearing a lot of sentiment about Jeremy on the doorstep, about he's not for this country, he stands up for other people. And that sentiment was still there in 2019. But by 2019, it was stock phrases that were coming up on almost every door. So there'd clearly been a very concerted personal campaign about him. But before there was the attacks on Jeremy Corbyn, there were the attacks on Ed Miliband. And before there was Ed Miliband, there was Gordon Brown. And actually, if you look all the way back to the eras of Wilson and Attlee, no Labour leader has ever got away from very, very personal criticism. And I think... There's the reason for this, which is that Britain, in my view, is a very decent but a very cautious country. We're evolutionary rather than revolutionary. And Labour has always been a movement that sought to make radical change. I think the country is ready for very deep, fundamental, transformative change. I think people want to see it. They don't want us to go back to an era where we were saying three quid off your energy bill and 12 quid off your childcare and, you know, vote for us and we'll, we'll, just, we'll just tinker a bit. They, they do want to see that change, but they need to be convinced that we can be trusted to do it. And so it's always going to be a higher bar for the Labour Party, I think, in order to make that case and to win that argument. And that's one of the reasons why the first big interview that I did in this campaign was with Andrew Neil, because I wanted our members to know that we're not going to run scared of this, that we're going to take these arguments on right at their core, not just around the edges. You know, the next Labour leader is going in 2024 we're going to be asking people to vote Labour who were two or three years old last time there was a Labour government so just banging on about Margaret Thatcher I did have her on my leaflets I won't lie but banging on about Margaret Thatcher and the National Health Service is not going to do it we're going to have to take on the Tory argument at the centre about what sort of country we are and what sort of country we can be and we're going to have to show that we've got an alternative and we're going to have to win that argument and that means running towards trouble and going to the places where it's hard and winning the argument, especially where it's hard. You spoke about Britishness there. What part of being British are you most proud of? Um, well, I've got a lot of English peculiarities, I think. So the sort of weird queuing thing that we do, if there's a queue, I will join it. <laughs> and I have very, very um, strong views about pubs and getting served in pubs so I have one of my best mates is German and she doesn't really understand this thing about standing in a line mm. at the bar like she thinks you have to stand in a queue mm. it's doesn't it's not right there is a queue it's just it's different lateral <laughs> it's lateral exactly yeah this is I mean these are the big issues that yeah. Joe is getting to the heart of always. It, I think. always um but I suppose there's a there's a British tradition for me that is is much, much more complex and um, uh, honest than the sort of Tory version that has dominated in recent years of this small, proud island nation that has led the world and goes out and punches above its weight in the world. I don't believe in a country that's punching at all. I want to see us working with other countries, with people in those countries, to rise us all up together. It's one of the reasons why I was so passionately in favour of the European Union, because for all its imperfections, it was a project that came about after the war in order to knit our interests together and try and raise up standards, not just the living standards of people across the EU, but to try and level up those standards across the world through the trade deals that we do and the diplomacy that we're able to exert. And that's the sort of country that I believe in, you know, with its complex, messy, diverse, sometimes troubled history. You know, let's not airbrush any of that. That's, that's there, it's real, it's honest, it's important. And the last time that I really felt that that story was told was 2012 during the opening ceremony of the Olympic Games. And it's one of the reasons why when I decided to stand to be the leader of the Labour Party and the next Labour Prime Minister, I, I rang up Danny Boyle and said, can we have a chat about this? Because actually nobody has really captured that for me, either before or since. And it was a sort of slightly strange moment in 2012 where it felt like that story was told for the first time, the ambitious, optimistic story about the future based on an honest assessment of where we'd been in the past. And then very quickly after that, it chimed with the whole, you know, it felt like it chimed with the whole country. It wasn't just for people who count themselves as left wing. It, it really sort of resonated. 
And then suddenly we went straight from that into an independence referendum in Scotland and almost witnessing the breakup of the United Kingdom. And then the 2016 referendum on Brexit and then all of the anger and the division and, you know, Joe Cox, my colleague and friend, being killed, rising political violence, hate crimes on the rise and, you know, smashing up our relationships with our closest friends and allies across the world. And it, it, was, almost, it was, you know, sort of this moment where hope and ambition was sort of personified and then it all unravelled really fast and when I asked him about it he said well we are still that country that we were in 2012 but what it needs is leadership to give voice to it and that is what I'm determined to do not just on April the 4th when hopefully you know if you all vote for me I'm, uh, I'm the next leader of the Labour Party but now in this contest we've got to start giving voice to that people are desperate to hear it. Glamorous life for you Lisa and Andy with Danny <laughs> Ball in your phone book. I know I don't have a lot of celeb mates to be honest um, um, I'm hoping to get to know Britney Spears through the course of this campaign. Great well if that's the only thing you achieve I'll be very happy for you. So will I. <laughs> um, we need to we need to talk about LGBT issues LGBT rights um, at a recent Labour Party meeting Someone stood up and asked you a question, yeah. and they asked you about the case of a person who had raped a child and then since self-identified as a woman, and whether that person should then be imprisoned with other women. You said yes. Can you explain why? Well, I didn't say that he should be, or she should be, imprisoned with other women, but the question was, does a person who self-identifies as a woman have the right to be accommodated in a women's prison? And the answer to that is yes. But not with other women. We would never accommodate violent offenders alongside other prisoners and other non-violent offenders. There are serious questions about safety in women's prisons that go way beyond this issue. Mm. And they're some of the things that we really ought to be talking about and ought to be tackling and haven't had enough attention in recent years. But I believe that um, the Gender Recognition Act, which was designed to try and help and support people going through the trans process, um, has actually become something that is part of the problem. Very, very lengthy delays. So I've got a young girl in my constituency who's going through the process at the moment. She's been waiting years without any support. She's been bullied at school. She's having a really tough time. Her family are having a tough time. Very long processes without support. But also, it's a very stigmatising process. And self-identifying is a really, really important part of the fundamental right of people to be able to say, I, I know better than any kind of you know, psychiatric assessment could determine who I am and what I'm about. I've always taken that view, is that it's not for politicians or for me as an individual to tell people who they are, that's for them to determine. And then the challenge becomes where you've got a horrendous criminal like this individual, how do you make sure that they are locked up and um, dealt with and you know, the interventions are right in a way that doesn't put other people at risk. And that, you know, I was being honest about the answer to that question. I think we've got into a situation in the Labour Party around this debate where we've, you know, we're essentially, we, we've created a lot of heat, but not a lot of light. And it doesn't seem to me that it could be beyond our collective wit to feel really, really strongly that women need safe spaces where they are safe, where they're protected, especially for a lot of women that I represent who've experienced domestic violence. For the rest of their lives, some of those women will not feel safe, even if they're no longer at immediate risk of harm. They deserve and need the right to know that Labour is on their side and that will support them. But I don't understand how this has become a zero-sum game where their rights are pitted against trans women who are some of the most marginalised, discriminated against, victimised people in the country. We surely have got to be able to stand for both. And actually one of the positive things about this leadership campaign is the fact that Keir, Becky, me, Emily, Jess and Clive all say the same thing. Every single person who stood to be leader of the Labour Party believes in that principle. We have spent the whole contest talking about it, though, which is, you know, a bit strange given that we don't, you know, the, it's, it's a real agreement. debate and it's important, but there is there is broad agreement on this issue, whereas on other issues there aren't. So. So why do you think that is then? Why do you think, you know, you mentioned how heated it's become, and that you're always asked about it. I know I'm asking you about it now. Why do you think that is? Why do you think this issue has grabbed people in this way? I think you'd be sort of better place to to answer that than me, to be honest. I mean, it, you know, I did the Today programme the other day and I, 
you know, I don't tend to do it that often because, to be honest, if I want to talk to my constituents, I'm on like Heart FM with Joel and Lorna in the morning because that's what they're listening to and also it's what I listen to so I just like it. They play better music. But, um, There's no music on Radio 4. Well, they play sort of shouting on Radio 4. Mm. But they you know, went on to talk about you know, how we're going to win back the country and spent the entire interview talking about this. And I'd, I don't know. I mean, I suppose it's something... But, you know, you would know better than me, but I think one of the reasons is because it's something that isn't very well understood in this country. It reminds me a bit about the debates about LGBT rights when I was a kid. Um, and there were all sorts of, you know, there were Tory MPs who were stirring up issues around things like um, adoption from same-sex couples and, you know, people like, I, I, hopefully I'm not going to tarnish or unfairly but I seem to remember Anne Widdicombe was out saying you know think of the children think of the children and I remember it really having an impact on me as a kid growing up because that's exactly what people said to my parents when they got married because they were different racial backgrounds and you know how the hell are the kids going to turn out well you know judge for yourself <laughs> don't be too harsh <laughs> but um but it's it, it felt very new then and very very misunderstood and I think the issue about trans rights is probably the same now it's something that people are only just starting to get their heads around last question have you ever taken drugs yes which ones well, not for a long time. <laughs> I've barely been out in the last <laughs> decade. So well, even true. getting a pint <laughs> is becoming increasingly difficult. Um, but, um, you know, a few. I've dabbled. But um, what was it Becky said? Let's just say I've been to Amsterdam. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, so Also been to Amsterdam. I, I could say I've also been to Amsterdam, although then people would think that me and Becky are off in Amsterdam trip every, together. every yeah. weekend. <laughs> Listen, Andy, thank you so much. Cheers. Really appreciate it. Thanks.